Hi everyone, this is Mr. Neil Reiterter, also known as the Wax Whisperer. I hope you're all well. Thank you for tuning in to my latest video. For anyone who doesn't know who I am, I'm a UK-based consultant audiologist and clinical ear care specialist. I'm also the founder of a company called Clearwax. We are the developers, manufacturers and distributors of the wireless eye clearscape, which is a device that we use to visualise the ear um, and we use in these procedures. Um, uh, got two patients today. Uh, the first one, a um, patient contacted her saying that she's been diagnosed with a fungal ear infection. Um, she was away on holiday, uh, I think she's got a private yacht, um, and they jumped into the, to, to the water, to the ocean water, and the ear got blocked up, and since then she's not able to hear from the right side. I'm not convinced it was a fungal infection. Uh, However, they've been prescribed caniston uh, eardrops, which is very good for it's an antifungal medication, and they've been using it for a while. So it could have been, yeah, they, they possibly had a bit of a fungal infection, but it's not really visible uh, to the naked eye today because they've been using these drops. All this gunk, I would say it's wet wax, keratin, and because the ear got wet, it just uh, became uh, very soggy and it exacerbated her symptoms. So. If you've got earwax and you go underwater, the wax absorbs all the drops and expand and swell, become wet, squelchy. Uh, the patient has got a bit of otitis externa. You can just see it as we're going into the entrance of the ear. It's very dry, very narrow. She does uh, advise that she's got, uh, she, she suffers from rashes and eczema around the body. So I've recommended some hydrocortisone, steroid cream, which you can get over the counter for the external part of the ear, the conchobol. So just from busy removing all this debris, which I feel it's wax, um, and you can see the eardrum there. Uh, with, with a fungal infection, you normally see a few spores, um, so kind of black or yellow, sorry, black or green dots. Um, when I see a fungal infection, the hairs go stand up on the back of my neck. It's just one of those things that make you feel a bit uneasy, I don't know what it is about it. I just, when I see all these spores in the ear, um, yeah, the hairs do go up on, the, on my back, on the back of my neck. Um, you, fungal infections, uh, it can also, uh, generally, um, I've also noticed uh, with fungal infections, a layer of dead keratin on the, the, the eardrums, a layer of dead skin, and you can see the spores on that. That's another landmark. Uh, and also, you can get candida, which is another type of fungal infection. You get it almost looks like a spider's web or a ball of cotton wool and again when I just think about that right now and I just think of fungal infections and the spores and these kind of like a spider's web or formation of a substance that looks like cotton wool it's, it just makes me shiver a bit. Uh, nonetheless I actually enjoy removing it it's quite satisfying. Um, so just to be on the safe side I really want to make sure just in case this patient has got a bit of fungal infection and it's it's on this layer of skin which doesn't look infected I just wanted to remove as much of this layer of dead keratin off the canal wall so I know the people that love skin peels are going to enjoy this just using a fine end gorge the ear canal is quite narrow so not only is uh, the entrance of an auditory canal um, the, the ear canal a bit narrow and for that I've had to use the endoscope tip so the bit that we're looking with uh, the endoscope at the moment, the tip of it, what we call the distal end, we insert that into the ear canal entrance and I have to stretch the cartilage um, posteriorly, so to the rear, to the back. So we're using it almost like a crowbar. So I'm going in and I'll talk you through, I'm going in and I'm pushing the cartilage to the left to widen the ear, um, to, to stretch it open, which then allows me to insert the fine end. Um, so we're just going near the eardrum there, so I'm just going to as much as we can but safely as possible. The patient still has got some caniston eardrops left so I've recommended that she continue to use it just in case with fungal infections they can sometimes be underlying, uh, unbeknown, you think they're treated but they're still there. They can be very very stubborn um, and resistant and uh, difficult to, to, to treat medically. Um, so the patient is going to continue to use the caniston, uh, just some dead keratin at the roof, Again, it's quite difficult um, because the ear canal is a bit narrow, so manipulating the instruments, there's less freedom um, in the ear to manipulate these instruments, but 
this is one of the benefits of endoscopic earwax removal compared to uh, microscopic with a microscopic loops. With those techniques, you use an ear speculum, which is like an ear funnel to widen the ear, and you, you look through the, the speculum, which narrows, it has a narrowing tip, and that automatically reduces um, not only the view of the ear canal, but the degree of movement you can have within the ear canal with the, with the various instruments, because you're, um, so some of these tips of the speculum can be either two or four millimetres, and the ear canal itself is about seven to nine millimetres on average. So I've got full exploitation of that whole ear canal to manipulate the instrument, but when you have got a, a narrow ear, it is obviously a bit tricky still nonetheless. So just a bit of keratin in the anterior recess, just peeling this away. I think that's more or less Done. So the eardrum looks fine, doesn't look really heavily affected, but yeah, the entrance there, there is a bit of otitis externa. So this is the second patient, um, a huge lump of um, a plug of wax. Um, it's been in there for a while. The patient advised that um, it's been in there at least six months during lockdown. Uh, one thing led to another, uh, just managing with it, but last week just suddenly stopped being able to hear. It's a very glutinous type of wax, very sticky, uh, very dry. Uh, sorry, I wouldn't say dry, sorry, very wet and loose type of wax. So it's probably, um, so I'm doing a talk tomorrow with some DGPs and I was j just uh, researching, just refreshing my memory on earwax, the different organic compounds. So. Um, in the outer part of the ear canal, the outer third where the cartilage portion is, you have hair follicles and you have two types of glands. You have sebaceous glands, which are the glands that secrete an oily, it's called sebum, the, the substance. It's an oily, lipidy, waxy substance, which is made up of squalene, alcohols, um, long change of saturated and unsaturated saturated fatty acids, alcohol, so esters. These um, organic compounds combined create sebum, which is the substance that we normally find on our hair. So it's the kind of the natural oil of the hair. And you also have ceremonious glands in the outer third of the ear canal. These are a modified sweat gland. So it's kind of similar glands to have what we have under our armpit. And when these two glands, all the secretions of the sweat and the sebum, they combine with um, dead skin to combine earwax. So you either get dry earwax or you get wet earwax. Um, dry earwax is generally found to be more uh, with older people and uh, people of far eastern descent or ancestry or Native Americans and it's believed and people from colder climates. So people from colder climates um, they don't have as much ceremonious glands, sweat glands for obvious reasons. In a cold climate you, you don't need these sweat glands because you you want to actually retain heat not uh, dispersive heat through sweat. Um, so sweat is obviously a mechanism to help regulate and reduce your core body temperature. Um, so it, it's kind of, you can, you can assume people from cold climates or have ancestry links to cold climates generally have dry wax because there's less ceremonious uh, sweat glands in there. And those, uh, and they will have a high percentage of dry skin. So probably 60% of earwax is dry skin. So uh, especially from the Far East, you see a lot of these videos of patients with very, very dry skin. So they have probably a high composition of dead skin in their earwax, probably sort of 60, they have 80%. Um, interestingly, ceremonious glands are, uh, are thought to be there from birth, but they're activated um, at puberty and they're stimulated by stress, a feeling of pain or feeling frightened and also sexual arousal apparently. Yeah, you hear, heard it here first. Um, there's been some uh, interesting studies recently that you're able to measure stress levels uh, from earwax. So one of the uh, neurotransmitters or should I say chemicals that are secreted by stress is cortisol and you can measure that um, through um, earwax. So I'm guessing there's a link there between that and the ceremonious glands. Um, and if you think about when people are stressed, they generally sweat, or if they're nervous, they sweat. So it all has a link there. Um, 
And those people with wet wax generally uh, have the cerebrovenous gland, the sweat glands, which can mean they have more body odour. Again, there's a link there. People with wet wax generally have uh, body odour, so uh, obviously armpit odour. Um, and sebaceous glands can be linked to um, um, diet because a lot of those organic compounds, uh, cholesterol, saturated fatty acid change, esters, cholesterols, um, alcohol, sorry, they're all kind of in our diet. So, sorry, I kind of talked through that video, but ultimately I just put some olive oil drops in there just to say change the consistency, manage to remove out in a big bulk. You saw an image of the weight, so it's 313 milligrams, so quite a large chunk of a uh, heavy weighing piece of earwax. I hope you enjoyed that video, guys, and speak to you soon. Bye.